I'm going to get into reading your bio, Kaden, and then we're going to get into the questions. Okay. So I'm going to read your full bio, okay? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Kaden Coleman, uh, who uses he, him pronouns, is a Black transgender educator, advocate, and seahorse dad. He is a well-known and respected reproductive justice advocate for the trans masculine community. He is also the author of the much anticipated upcoming children's book, Dads Give Birth To. He has presented at universities, including Harvard, Duke, Yale, Old Dominion University, and many more. He was named in Out 100 in 2021, and he lives in Houston, Texas. Born and raised in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Caden has been transitioning from female to male for over 13 years and has dedicated his life to being an out and proud Black transgender man who has given birth to two beautiful daughters, Azalea and Journey. In 2015, a year after giving birth to his first child, Caden's pregnancy story went viral following an article published in the UK-based Daily Mail. In 2020, just weeks after giving birth to his second child, Caden's story went viral again when a public figure running for a political office used his pregnancy photos and videos to fuel a hate-mongering campaign against the transgender community. Caden Coleman has been profiled in numerous publications such as Today, ABC News, and Good Morning America. He has given numerous workshops and speeches to organizations such as AWHONN, IKEA, Acura, and numerous reproductive organizations around the globe. His newest series, Transgender Talk, has generated a buzz and sparked an interest in learning about the transgender community. As an educator, influencer, and public speaker, Caden Coleman is dedicated to making the world a safer and more equitable place in amplifying the voices of the often invisible trans masculine community. Yay! Let's give, I went ahead and copied and pasted the link in the chat so y'all can go ahead and check it out. If you want to book him, that's how you do it as well. So mm -hmm. <laughs> let's get into it. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, Kaden, although I just read your bio, mm -hmm. how would you introduce yourself? It's not nearly as um, intricate as that. Um, I am 36. I'll be 37 in, I don't know, two and a half weeks or so. Um, Gemini? Or is that, uh... Of course not. I am a cancer. <laughs> uh, my birthday is July 5th. Okay. Um, uh, I reside in Houston, Texas. Um, I am black, gay, trans, yes, seahorse dad, um, educator, advocate, keynote speaker, author, uh, consultant, content creator, um, business owner, dog dad all of the things, um, that's really it, you know. Thank you. Um, yeah. Can you walk us through uh, your journey of becoming a transgender man? Um, and who supported you along your way? Sure. Um, so I don't have the typical story of, I knew ever since I was just a young kid, I knew that I was different. I knew that I wanted to feel normal, right? Uh, you know, I had a stepsister who was very, and is still very feminine. She loved doing her hair and all of, you know, wearing dresses. And I had no interest in things like that. Like I wanted to play football in the church parking lot. I didn't mind dresses. Um, I, that wasn't my go-to. I was not like a skirt wearer. I did not, I still to this day, I can do hair now, ironically, but like I have none, so that doesn't help. Um, but I just was never good at like doing my hair. I never just, I didn't find interest in doing hair or makeup until after I started transitioning. Um, I just, it just, you know, the societal standards of what a woman is, just never resonated with me. I thought I was everything else. I spent my entire childhood um, and adolescence trying to figure out who I was. I went, I was Gothic. For a moment, I was, I thought I was white. I'm not even gonna kid, I'm not even gonna lie to you. Like I was trying to be anything but myself because I was uncomfortable in self. Um, I spent a lot of time depressed and feeling like an outcast. 
And I found community in the lesbian community because I was able to present in a masculine manner. The problem was <laughs> I don't really, I, I, I find women to be attractive, but that's not who I was like wanting to date. I also was not willing to date men being perceived female. It just wasn't, it was very uncomfortable for me. I also am attracted to gay men. I don't know. I didn't make the rules. I'm just me, right? Um, so, you know, I identified as a lesbian for a long time and, but it, it just was really unfulfilling for me. And I still was really uncomfortable. Um, I began looking into like, um, binding my chest. Um, and I still wasn't identifying as male at the time, but I knew I wanted to bind my chest. And my girlfriend at the time, uh, she was like, well, what is your family going to think? I grew up in a very religious uh, Jamaican household. Uh, my father is like alpha male city. You know, it was just, you know, I worried a lot about my family disowning me. So I threw all of that out. Um, and this was a long time ago. So when you looked online for like testosterone and things of that nature, you just saw a bunch of like gray market things over in like India that were really scary. Like we didn't have the same internet, you know, in 2007, right? Uh, so I was like, whatever, I'm just, I'm pushing all of this aside. Um, 2008 came around and I fell into a very deep depression. Um, and I was really suicidal and I took a lot of time to myself. Like I was very recluse. I was very much a cancer. I, I went into my shell and I started doing a lot of soul searching. And the year before that, I helped my best friend with his transition because I did a lot of research on it. So I helped him with whatever resources I found. And I started to realize that this is what I needed for myself too, because I was seriously considering, you know, just ending my life. Uh, so I moved down to, I was living in Maryland at the time and I moved down to Atlanta and, and Atlanta is where I began my medical transition. But before I moved, I began my social transition where I chose my name. Fun fact, my name was, was almost Camden. I don't even look like a Camden, do I? Um, <laughs> um, and I came up on Caden and everybody always asked me, how do you come up with Caden? It was so orig unoriginal. Um, my nickname was Kay. Everybody called me Kay, as in K-A-Y. And before I got married, my last name was Dennison. Kaden. That's how I came up with Caden. <laughs> now everybody's Caden, Aiden, Jaden, Raiden. Um, but I was one of the originators of Caden, just throwing that out there too. So if you have like a nephew, you're welcome. Um, <laughs> um, and so, you know, I navigated, you know, I went to therapy and for a long time before I started my transition, because I wanted to make sure that it was, this was the right uh, decision for me. Um, I got my name changed, uh, started hormones. I started my hormones officially in 2010. Um, and I got top, my top surgery in March of 2013. And I mean, I still take testosterone to this day, uh, but that's kind of like my journey. I, it was definitely like a life or death uh, situation for me. And I can say that while we all suffer at some point from mental health, I mean, we're all, I'm not saying I'm not depressed now, but I'm not depressed now because of my gender identity not aligning with, with who I am. Thank you. I mean, you had talked about how you supported your best friend and how um, fearful you were or um, at least just cognizant and aware like of your parents' reaction. So who mm -hmm. did support you um, like in your medical and even like in your social transition outside of like the lesbian community and stuff? Were there specific people or institutions that like? Uh, my my then roommate when I was living in Maryland, um, whose name was also Kay, uh, she was one of my biggest supporters and my best friend, which is why I moved down to Atlanta. That's where he lived at, at the time, uh, were the biggest um, support systems I had at the time. Um, my, I didn't actually tell my family that I was transitioning until I started taking hormones. Um, and it took them some time, a long time to come around, but I had prepared myself for that. And as I came out, I started building community within the trans community, uh, because back in that, in that time, 
uh, it was very hard for the lesbian community to understand as well. So the friends and, and support that I had in that time, I lost most of them. Uh, so it was, it was a very alienating experience. And, you know, even as when, when I came out as gay, that was even more alienating because as a black person, you didn't see black gay trans men. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a thing. And a lot of trans men at the time, uh, they took offense to it. They took offense to my sexuality because to them, they were worried that all, everybody would think that all trans men dated men. And to them, trans men dating men was an affront to their manhood. It made them less of men. Uh, so that was super alienating. So I had like my few, my chosen few that were super um, present for me uh, that I'm still very close with to this day. And you had um, also talked about chest binding and like the medical transitions and stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you break down um, exactly for folks who don't know like what a chest binder is and what is, I don't wanna say what is included, but what is a part of like the medical transition journey in comparison yeah. to the social transition journey? Sure, yeah, so social transitioning, I'll start with that. Uh, social transitioning is, hey, um, this is my gender identity. Here are my pronouns. Uh, this is my name. This is how I would need for you to refer to me. It might look like if I was dressing more feminine and I wanted to change that to adhere to societal standards, it might look like me changing the way I dress, the way I present myself, which restrooms I go to, uh, things like that. that. That's your social transition. Mm -hmm. um, chest binding. Chest binding looks different for a lot of people. It depends on the size of your chest, honestly. There are some people who can just wear a sports bra and, and, and look very flat chested. There's also binding tape uh, that like, if you have a smaller chest, you can just kind of like push it out. And it kind of tapes, but it's safe. It's not like duct tape. It's, it's safe for your skin. Back in the day, we didn't have binding tape. Uh, we, we were very like ace bandage or duct tape, which I've done, not cool. Um, and um, then they started coming out with actual binders and the binders weren't, weren't actually originally made for trans men. They were made for men with gynecomastia that wanted to, you know, have that flat appearance. Um, now they're made, there's chest binders made specifically for trans masculine people. So a chest binder, it often looks like a tank top Right. Some of them stop at like a crop and some of them are full tank tops. Um, if you have a larger chest, you're going to want a, a, a larger, you know, a full tank top. And the material is kind of like almost like a, if you can think of like a screen door, it's it kind of feels like that, but softer. Right. But there's no give to it. Like there's no you can't stretch into it. Binders are very difficult to get into because they are meant to flatten. So you have to like adjust and you, there's only a certain amount of hours a day that you're supposed to wear a binder. Um, and the whole point is to, I guess, be uncomfortable, but honestly, uh, to give you the appearance of a flattened chest. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of different companies out now, but you know, that's the purpose of a binder. Uh, medical transition uh, looks like, um, it looks different for everyone. Right. So a medical con transition is gender affirming care. Right. So that can be either starting your hormones like testosterone for trans masculine people, estrogen uh, for trans feminine uh, people, uh, surgery like top surgery, bottom surgery. Um, there's facial feminization, facial masculinization, uh, BBLs, nose jobs, body contouring. All of those are considered laser hair removal, hair plugs. All of those things are considered gender affirming. And just a quick caveat, all of the affirming, most of the affirming care that trans people get, cisgender people have been getting for eons, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so when we're talking about gender affirming care, it's not just medical transition either. Um, it could be hormone blockers. It could be um, just getting care that any care that affirms your gender. 
Thank you um, for breaking that down, especially I think with everything um, politically that's going on regarding um, queer and trans and gender yes. not forming gender binary mm -hmm. uh, youth and you are a father to two beautiful black children yes um, right now and parents are fighting schools over pronoun usage and I saw yes. a story recently um, where a school district was sued um, by a parent because a counselor did give a, a chest binder uh, to a student that had asked them for it. Mm -hmm. Sport policies, right? Yes. Back usage and more. Um, yes. What is your commentary on this pro-parent movement forming? Do you think supporting trans and queer youth at any age is critical? And yes, why? absolutely. Um, it is critical because, and I'll tell you, this way. I think that lived experience is the most important educator when it comes to the trans, uh, to transness and the trans experience, because um, I think that a lot of us look now, like I know for, um, I was just recently uh, in Washington, D.C. at a at an event, and I met my first uh, trans kids. And when I say my body was covered in goosebumps, like even talking about it now, just goosebumps, because I think back and I'm like, man, if I would have just had that opportunity, like what the trajectory of my life would have looked like, I would have spent less of my life trying to figure out who I was and more of my life actually experiencing my life, right? I feel like I missed out on so much because I was trying so hard to be who everyone else was telling me I had to be. And a lot of these policies and these, these protections of kids are not protections of kids. They are the protection of the beliefs of the adults, right? That are rooted in transphobia. They're no, what, and how you know that's apparent is that nobody is actually taking the time to speak to these kids. They don't care what these kids have to say. They do not care how these kids feel and they're not doing any research. And when you present them with the facts, they act like they suddenly can't hear or comprehend anything, mm -hmm. right? And they say it's all part of an agenda, but what agenda would it be? I have no desire to make anyone else trans. There, we don't wake up every morning and be like, yep, today's the day I'm going to make that person oh, get that gender affirming. That's crazy. Like, we don't care. We literally don't care. Um, and gender affirming care for kids, and that's why I even said what I, what I said about gender affirming care, is not mutilating kids. And honestly, if people cared so much about not mutilating these kids, they would not allow these doctors to um mutilate intersex babies and allow their parents to choose their gender while they're non-consensual infants right this has been going on for decades right so it's not about all of this let's pr protect the kids it's just a guys it's 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 fear-mongering mm -hmm. um they don't care about these kids and all of the policies are going to affect cisgender children as well I don't know if y'all saw the news about the um, the male, the father at that sporting event uh, for children mm -hmm. where there was a cisgender little girl playing and he accused her of being trans and demanded that she show her genitals mm -hmm. and called her a groomer and a pedophile, a child, just because she did not fit the standard of what a woman or a little girl, mind you, should look like. So if you think that these, these policies are somehow going to be a protection of children or even adults, it's not. Because if you have a woman with PCOS uh, or higher levels of testosterone who's tall or built in a certain way, who's to say somebody's not going to physically harm or, 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 harass them for trying to use the restroom or and on the flip side making people trans people use the restroom uh with for the gender assigned at their birth would you want to walk into the women's restroom and see me in there i doubt it mm -hmm. um and if 
there are trans masculine people that have to use that the women's restroom. What's to stop a cisgender man now from walking into the women's restroom and saying, oh, I'm a transgender man. You didn't have trans, you didn't have cisgender men dressing up as trans women, pretending to be women and accosting women in the restroom, but now you're opening the door for them to do it, mm -hmm. right? So I think, you know, my commentary is that, um, it's all a way to, I think that trans people are the easiest group to, to uh, target. Mm -hmm. And it's just a small space in which once they take away our rights, they're going to go to the next marginalized group. And they're already starting with the drag queens and, and gay people. And then they're taking critical race theory and everything out of schools. It's, it's a way to make cisgender white men great again. That's my commentary. I, um, I posted the article in the chat for anybody who wanted reference to what um, Kaden was referring to. It really is um, very tragic. I read it earlier this morning, a nine-year-old girl was accosted um, by a grandfather of another student that was at a track meet in Canada, um, and she was demanded to show her genitals, um, and she was demanded, uh, not even just demanded, but like literally uh, accused of being something that she was not, and she was visibly shaking and crying, um, and the school has since, you know, like removed him and like his family and stuff, but this happened all in front of her classmates and this happened, um, you know, all in front of the rest of the school. And this is, you know, a nine-year-old girl who had a bald um, haircut. Um, and so it's it's getting really, really um, dangerous, which we all um, hopefully have been seeing and tracking. Um, and I'm glad you brought up some other policies um, and how this also affects cisgender folk and how this is something that's a ripple effect for other marginalized identities. Are there any other legislations that you um, have been following as a trans man or you have been impacted by or you want us to just like have awareness about? Yes. So um, in Florida currently, um, it is basically OK to kidnap the child of a trans person uh, based off of the fact that they are trans. Um, that is an actual legislation that is in the works of being passed or it may have already passed um and so there are you know i have a friend who's a seahorse dad um who had to raise money to get himself and his one-year-old out of florida because what can happen is say for example catherine just doesn't like me mm -hmm. For no other reason than maybe I'm, you know, I didn't trim my hedges. She could call the cops and be like, "Hey, this person is trans, and they're in, in a, a, uh, uh, you know, a danger to these to to their kids," and CPS will take those kids. So, and these these are things that are being introduced not just in Florida, but Florida was like the leader. And I grew up in Florida. I say that with so much shame in my soul. But yes, um, there are a lot of things that are happening that it's not just they're not just trying to take away gender affirming care for children. They are trying to make it so that even adults cannot get gender affirming care, but only trans adults, not cisgender adults. Cisgender adults can still get um, gender affirming care. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I also found um, an article that linked to this Florida legislator. Um, and I think the what irritates me is, you know, after Trump, a lot of people are like, oh, racism is, you know, racism. And like with Florida, people are just like, oh, that's just Florida. But we need to understand that this is something that can be replicated in all of our states. It is something that can be easily copied and pasted into all of our um, governing situations. Um, I know even myself living in Virginia, Governor Yunkin has a strong liking to Governor DeSantis. Um, and this is Virginia, you know, we're not that far away from DC. So I want folks to be mindful that what affects one affects us all. Um, mm -hmm. And please, please reach out to folks and do your research. Um, so moving forward, you touched on church a little bit. Um, and please feel free, you know, to share. I don't want to, um, you know, like traumatize, like harm you, like in any way. Uh, but can we talk about the church? Um, sure. 
what is your religious affiliation or what is your relationship um, with the church right now? I don't have a relationship with the church right now. Um, I also don't have any religious of uh, religious affiliation. Um, I'm torn uh, with as far as what I believe. Um, I do, however, respect everyone's beliefs um, mm -hmm. as long as they're not trying to harm anyone else uh, with their beliefs. But I did grow up in the church. Mm -hmm. That's just where I'm at. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I respect that. Um, so the Community Renewal Society, like we exist to help churches to be co-conspirators for liberation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Within my role specifically, like advocating for queer liberation. Yes. Um, so what does queer liberation mean to you? Or what does it smell like? What does it look like? What do you hear? I hear... The biggest word that comes to me is equity. Um, I don't, I think that when people hear things like queer liberation and things like that, they think that trans and queer people are looking for way more than what we are looking for, right? Um, right as, as we speak, I think that queer liberation looks like basic respect and and liberties and equity right mm -hmm. being able to not having to choose between your transness your queerness and your belief system um not having not having something that you may hold dear to your to your heart being used as a weapon against you um I just feel as though I can't tell you. I mean, I um, have a presence on TikTok, and I'm usually on TikTok Live pretty much every day. And every day, every single day, I'm told I need to repent, and I'm going to hell, and I'm there's a demon in me, and all of these things. And so for me, like queer liberation just means existing, right? I just want to exist peacefully. That's it. I want to be able to parent my children and I want to be able to navigate life without feeling like I have to claw and fight my way out of into any space, every space. Um, and, you know, I, I also am queer. I'm trans and queer. So, you know, those and black. So those intersecting identities make it very hard for me to navigate spaces. It makes it very hard for me to even imagine liberation. Like I, I have a lot of places, I have a lot of places, boxes I need to fight out of. So for me, I saw that question. I did see that question and I've been thinking on it and thinking on it and thinking on it. And honestly, for me, as low as that bar seems, I just want to be able to exist peacefully. That's what it looks like for me. That was such a beautiful answer. I'm so sorry for my asshole of a cat that decided to attack That's me. That's what cats are, though. Mm -hmm. <sighs> That's what they are. And we love them anyway. It is such a complicated <laughs> relationship. He's just staring at me like, yeah. And I'm like, we're going to box after this. But, <laughs> um, if y'all want a cat, please let me know. But I, I'm also very sorry that you are receiving that type of messages every day. I can't imagine the the type of hardening or um, the type of softening like your skin has to endure like on a day-to-day -day basis to still show up, do these events or even just still show up um, for your own children. Um, so I just wanna take a moment to let you know that I do see you and I very much so want oh, you to take you into thank all you. and all spaces. Um, and I think you very much so deserve to be here and I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate um, that. So, um, I'll take a moment here to also let anybody else, if they have any questions, because I know um, we're approaching like that 30 minute hour and I have about three more, but if anybody has any other questions or comments um, at this time. Oh, just for you to unmute y'all, this ain't a classroom, I am no professor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi guys, um, Kaden, thank you so much for um, sharing this information um, and just coming to share this space. I 
Um, so my name is Avalon. I actually am the board chair for the Community Renewal Society. Um, and so I appreciate you coming to, um, you know, give us this information and share this with our audience and with our organization. Absolutely. But I have, I have two questions. Sure. <laughs> so please, please extend grace to me in my multiple questions. So the first question is, and because this is a passion area for me, and I know that um, there's, there's an intersectionality between trans and specifically Black trans women, and not to, not mm -hmm. to, not to dim your light or anything like that, no, absolutely. but that and, and incarceration, yes. right? Uh -huh. Like, so there is a huge um, intersectionality. And so in my other life, <laughs> I do advocacy um, related to the carceral systems. Mm -hmm. um, specifically the criminal legal system. And so how can, I guess when I, when, how, how can we, our, our communities begin to kind of work more together? Because how I see it, the way that these laws are coming hot, fast and furious is that it is not just not even like, it is a train crash happening yes. between yes the attack on trans, the trans community and the carceral system. And I think that because we operate oftentimes in two different spaces and in yeah. silos, that we're not having that conversation because we kind of know, we've experienced what they're trying to make you guys experience, right? And so how can we work together more closely um, in ways that, um, prevents that from happening, right? So not just from the policy standpoint, but how do we can create community to um, support one another and keep one another safe and out of the grasp of the criminal legal system? So that's my, that was, that was a really long question. <laughs> it was, it was. Um, so when I think of specifically black trans women and allyship, um, I usually don't speak on the trans feminine experience simply because that's not my lane. And I don't, as a cis assumed trans man, I don't want to take up space um, because uh, we tend to do that when we have privilege over someone when I'm talking about like the, the pyramid of of power and privilege goes. And I acknowledge my privilege as a cis assumed man, right? Um, however, when I think of allyship, when it comes to the trans community as a whole, um, it starts with acknowledging the privilege and power that you have. Um, I think what happens w between the communities, communities is that there's this head bumping that happens because, um, and I'm speaking about uh, trans women and cisgender women specifically, as somebody who stands outside of that argument because although I am a transgender person, I am left out of the conversation because to most people, trans men don't exist, right? Um, so I'm usually on the outside of these conversations. And what I see is um, kind of like this oppression Olympics that happens, right? As a, as a woman, um, I have experienced all of these hardships. And I feel like now that trans women are the center of the conversation, um, my hardships are being um, overlooked or depleted. And so what I need to do is I need to make sure that people know that I am a real woman and that trans women are just men and they, they still hold this power and they can be misogynistic and yada, yada, yada. And am I saying that trans women are not capable of being misogynistic? No, but I am saying that understanding, I think that understanding the similarities between the two would be so helpful because trans women's experience aligns so much with cisgender women's experiences. But what ends up happening is because we are taught, and I say we because I was assigned female at birth, that when you have a vagina and a uterus and fallopian tubes and ovaries and you're able to bear children, that's your womanhood. That's who you are, right? 
and because you've had to fight for bare basic rights, right? Um, you do that and they make, they, they have still taught you that yes, you can get these rights, but still your womanhood is centered around your ability to reproduce, which is why so many women, and I do work in reproductive justice, so many women feel like less of women when they are infertile or unable to carry to term and things of that nature, right? And so what happens is it's like, hey, I have this womb, I'm a real woman, you can never carry babies, you're not a real woman, you don't know our plight. However, when it comes to lived experience, you know, reproduction be damned, Trans women still suffer at the hands of cis women in the same respects that cisgender women do. Trans women are being murdered at alarming rates at the hands of cisgender men. They are being sexually abused, raped, physically assaulted at the hands of cisgender men in the same ways that cisgender women are, simply because they are seen as women, whether you want to see them as women or not. So I think that that recognizing stop stop leaning into the differences because that's what that's what men want i'm just being honest that's what they want and they're choosing to be divisive because most of those men that are speaking out the most as somebody i am in this community those are the men that seek those trans women out the most and here go women like yes let's contribute to the divisiveness right but i always tell black women the same thing you weren't even seen as women a few years ago so the same argument that you're using against trans women were used against you by cisgender white women, right? Cisgender white women, yeah, you were seen as women, but you were you were seen as this lesser being. So like, there's way more similarities than there are differences, right? And understanding that is a is a great stepping stone, and then understanding that even though you have had these these uh, plights and, and, and this oppression happen, that also you still, because you're cisgender, have privilege over transgender women, right? And as somebody who has privilege, you should be using that privilege to uplift trans women and um, using your voice right as cisgender women to say hey the things that you're saying are wrong you're creating this divisiveness you're contributing to the violence and the murders of trans women and when i think of allyship the i always think of i don't know if y'all remember when all of the um protests were happening after george floyd and all of that and there was that one image of the police with their guns pointed at this, the black man and the white woman stood in front of him, right? And used her body as a shield. That's what allyship looks like, right? So she didn't say a word, she just stood there. And why that is so powerful is because a lot of the time with allyship, what ends up happening is the ally ends up taking the podium and they're doing too much and they're taking up too much space, right? But what you're supposed to be doing is to be looking at the oppressed, marginalized group and taking their leadership. And when the time comes, you stand in front of them and say, absolutely not. We're not letting this happen. You're going to respect this person and allow for us to say, okay, and now here's what we need to do and then move that way. And I think that if we could take away the stigmas that trans women have, right? And fight for um, employment equality and things of that nature, you would see so many less trans women in the system because they're usually in the system because they cannot get employment or they don't feel safe at their place of employment. So they turn to prostitution and they turn to drugs because those go hand in hand. And now they're in this system because they're homeless. And you know what? Three square meals a day is better than being out on the street and possibly being murdered. That was long winded too, but yeah. So, so, so you my type of people. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and then, so the second question is, um, so, and we, we do fight, we, I also will add that the system is rooted in racism and white supremacy. Oh, and so anyone with a black body is going to be mm -hmm. prone and targeted for, for arrest and prosecution, yes, of, absolutely. regardless of right. those things. But the other part, so this is, 
this is a conversation that we're having because um, we do advocate very strongly for um, Black trans women because we, we understand that that is the marginalized of the marginalized of the marginalized yes. in that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, and what we're finding, and this is, a, this is kind of, um, this is a touchy subject is anti-Blackness is finding its way into the trans community. And so it's been there right, it's finding its way. It's, it's been there. Well, it's, it's right. Right. Let me, let me, cause I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in the trans community, yeah. but what I'm hearing is that it is now kind of being elevated um, as, um, as people become more ex accepting and understanding of of trans people, period. And I mm -hmm. think that we are moving that direction, which is why we're having such a backlash, yes, right? Like course. push yes. So, Absolutely. so as, mm -hmm. as society becomes more accepting, I think that what, what happens is, is that we're seeing it show up, especially in the criminal legal reform space, mm -hmm. that, that trans white women are very carceral in their logic and, and, and that there's a root, some, root, some roots of anti-Blackness um, in there. And so do you find um, in you guys having that family conversation? Because, <laughs> you know, like you, you, you have to start having like I, we have family conversations involving people who are formerly incarcerated. That's our family conversation. Mm -hmm. Like, do you find you guys are having that conversation um, or starting to have those conversations um, <laughs> as well, especially because of the intersectionality? Again, I'm always thinking about the liberation of people mm -hmm. here, but also mm -hmm. from the carceral systems that um, are embedded in our society. So here's what I'll say. Um, there are a lot of us who speak up about anti-Blackness, me being one of them. I talk a lot about anti-Blackness and anti-racism and intersectionality, a lot, um, because um, White trans people, and I'm just going to be as candid as possible, will um, use their whiteness in every space that they can. And what I mean by that is white people tend to be more palatable for the masses, right? And so white people will weaponize their whiteness and use it in a way to elevate and remove themselves from the trans community, right? even though they're trans um, because it's like I'm trans but also look at me I'm this white person and I have this story and I'm marginalized because I'm trans right so feel sorry for me and because it's very very similar to white woman tears right um, very similar people want to save them they run to them they flock to them and I bring that up all the time because um, that's what makes my experience as a, as a seahorse dad you know so different is that I am a black seahorse dad my experience is not the same as everybody else's and so i have to fight way harder to get into spaces um to get accolades to get invited to certain spaces and and whereas the next seahorse dad the white ones all they have to do is exist they only have to exist i've we've we, we just kind of listed out my resume which isn't even all of it most of that's not even most of it right um and still people will reach over me and reach over to uh, a friend of mine, Danny, who happens to be white, to have him teach DE and I. And I'm like, how you, wait, what? <laughs> huh? And he'll have to be like, no, you hit up Caden. Um, so I talk about that a lot. Is it a conversation that's well received? No, it's not. Every time I even make a video or a post about it, I lose hundreds of followers each time when I speak um, at different organizations, for example, a one I spoke at a one and they did a um, survey afterwards. So many white women were like, and I only mentioned anti blackness one time it's not like I made a, I went on a whole tirade about it. But that's what they honed in on well I feel like as a white cisgender woman I just there's just nothing I can do and so. Anti-blackness has always existed, not only in the trans community, but just in the LGBT community as a whole. Um, and it's something that we as black and brown people have always been saying. It's starting to be 
talked about, but are people having family conversations about it? No. I'm just going to be honest with you. No. It's just not happening. Sorry, my, my daughter just tried to FaceTime me. She probably wants something, but she can wait. Okay. Thank you for that. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Avalon, for that beautiful, beautiful question and commentary. I was just chewing on all the things. Very, very delicious. Um, anybody else have a question or comment? Um, Morgan, I see your hand. And I think, Catherine, did you raise your hand too? Or was I tweaking? Okay, no. Okay, cool. All right, go ahead, Morgan. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for being present. Um, also, it's been really interesting, and I wrote it down or typed it down about the masculinity versus femininity part when it comes to the black trans experience, uh -huh. because I found it really interesting how similar our journeys were, um, especially being a black queer trans, right? Where on that intro community level, I, I've come to understand that some of the girls who are like, why are you out here being a lesbian? That don't even make sense. What would you do all this stuff for? I think some I of it was that. safety. And I, and I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I imagine that for them, they already realize that it's not safe us being ourselves and mm -hmm. you're, you're identifying yourself even more so, putting yourself more at risk when you're stepping into this other group, right? Mm -hmm. When the goal is to be passable, right? The goal is to be stealth eventually. Um, have you noticed that or did you notice that within trans, trans masculine spaces? Um, yes and no, I think, so I, like I said, when I came out as gay, um, it was not well received, um, uh, by anybody, specifically by the trans masculine community. Um, they wanted to fight me. I'm not kidding. Like, they were like, if you come, I was living in Philly at the time, if you come down to 13th Street, which is in the neighborhood, um, we're going to jump you. So I'm a troll. So I, I, I was as vulgar as I could be. I wore the most vulgar t-shirts. I would make them and go down to 13th Street and frolic. And, um, you know, eventually they ended up um, apologizing. Um, but there's this, there's this, there is this lack of feeling of safety um for me um mainly because there are still that there's still that grouping of trans masculine people especially i call them the baby trans the new and i'm not talking about age i'm talking about people who just started their transition and so they're they're not su super comfortable in themselves and so they feel like they have to be hyper masculine and they're like why would you be gay and why would you have kids and oh i'm not like that no 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 no, no. relax relax they they have that agitation um, but on uh, and also on the other side of things, cisgender gay men are now starting to feel very threatened by um, gay trans men, and they're being very vocal about it. And there's this anger and agitation that that comes with it. And me being so open about it um, is an issue. And then me being openly trans is an issue. So I think about safety a lot. Um, less about me and more about my kids' um, safety. Um, but I did want to touch on one thing that you said, and it's kind of, I, I, I want to point out that my goal when I transitioned was never to be stealth, ever. Um, and my goal was never to be passable. I just look like this. I didn't mean to look like this. It's just how I look. You know what I mean? It was never, I actually used to get really frustrated in the beginning of my transition because I wanted to be read as a feminine, gay, black man. That's what I wanted. Nothing about me is feminine. <laughs> I try. I used to wear full faces of makeup and nails and people would still be like, so how did your girlfriend feel about that? I'd be like, no, that's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> um, but so I, I think that when it comes to like safety, and I'm talking about from like the outside world, I, I have that privilege where I just, even though it was a privilege that I didn't really necessarily want, where I just don't have the same worries as other trans people do. And I never have. And so I don't like to speak in spaces where 
I'm not going to make up some fallacy. You know what I mean? To be like, oh, Caden's so deep. I really just didn't really ever experienced that except for within certain sides of the community but it wasn't to a space where i felt threatened it was just more of a space of like hmm let me tread a little carefully you know i never really was in a space where i felt like like my life was in danger or my job was in danger because i i'm i've i've always been in a space where i've had to convince people that i was trans if that makes sense i don't is, am I, is that answering your question in any way or Yes, you do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to be sure that I'm answering the questions. I know I can be long winded. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I personally want all the wind, all the smoke. Did I? <laughs> as long as possible. Um, another question from anybody before I move forward. Tyla, or I think that's Dr. Middleton. If any, Larry, Catherine, Katie, y'all good? Silence is okay. Mm -hmm. all right so we're gonna move forward we have about 25 minutes left Hayden and if there is um anything you want to share at the end like I know you're gonna be coming out with a book I don't know if it's already out um, it's but, not yet. okay but the book is coming and so if you want to talk about that um and share the links and other things to that um we would gladly do that but um, you did touch on this a bit um, earlier and I do want to just like these are all just like breaking things down because again the media tends to create and distort actual definitions of things. Right. So what is the difference between being a drag queen or identifying as trans person? That's easy. Um, drag queens are performing. Um, mm -hmm. They wake up as men and they dress up as women and then they go home and they take all that off and they go to sleep as men mm -hmm. for the most part. There are transgender drag queens. They exist. Um, and there are transgender women who are drag queens and there are transgender men who are drag queens. Uh, the transgender men wake up as men, they dress up, they go to sleep as men. The trans women, we are not, trans people do not wake up every morning. And I think this is how a lot of conservatives and transphobic people think that we do. I think a lot of people think I wake up and I'm like, Ugh. Oh, dead name. I say my dead name to myself. Oh, oh, wait, wait. No, my name is Caden now. Uh, okay, let me ugh, mask it up. Get ready to put on this show. I'm literally the same person when I wake up and the same person when I go to sleep. I'm not putting on a show. I'm not performing. I'm not pretending to be anyone. I am literally my whole full self every single day. Mm -hmm. There's no costume. Whereas drag, I mean, I think gender is a performance as a whole, right? Let's be real. Uh, mm -hmm. We're all just adhering to society, society, social constructs and what society said we should be, right? But that being said, um, drag is for entertainment. Being trans is not. It's not a lifestyle, it's just our life. We are just ourselves. We're not, so, we're not a preference. We're not, um, that's why I don't use words like preferred pronouns. My pronouns are just my pronouns. I don't have a preferred name. My name is my name. Um, you know, I am who I am every day. Drag queens are usually like Mike and, you know, their drag queen is whole lot of body, you know, like that's the, you know, and then when they're done out of that, they're back to being Mike. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Can you talk about why drag um, is important or like why um, at least allowing folks to participate in drag or like the drag culture like is important when we think about um, just being co-conspirators in terms of queer liberation and stuff like that? Drag is important because it's an art form. Mm -hmm. It is an art form. Like, I think that drag is honestly an ode to women first of all, um, and the beauty of women and the magic of women, right? And it's been conflated and turned into like this weird sexual thing. I don't know why um, transphobes and hom homophobes sexualize everything. It's like, if you think I'm cute, just say that. But honestly, like they think that like, being trans 
or gay is like this nonstop orgy that happens. And all we think about is sex and like, that would be great. But honestly, I have to pay bills and take care of my kids too, you know? Um, but drag is, is an art form and it's something that it's no different than going to watch a play or, you know, enjoying a Medea movie or watching Miss Doubtfire. It's somebody who is taking their talent and showcasing it. And drag queens have existed forever. Like it's always been a thing. I don't know why they're acting like it's something new all of a sudden. You know what I mean? Like we were watching Denzel Washington and Patrick Swayze and John Leguizamo in, in drag and laughing our asses off in the 90s. So I'm confused as to why all of a sudden we've sexualized it. And there was nothing sexual about that movie. Although I will say that Tu Wong Fu kind of leveraged uh, trans women. It kind of made trans uh, or drag queens seem like trans women, like they lived that life all day, every day. Like in real life, they would have been dressed like men driving to California, not dressed like women. Drive, driving to California. So the truth is, they weren't really men. But you know, back in the 90s, they didn't really understand that. But I, just to clear that up. I really care. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you talk about how drag has existed forever. And religion has also existed forever. Like, you know, yes. right, there really is no separation between church and state. Right. Um, exactly. And at the forefront of a lot of this onslaught and violence and harm against queer and trans communities are church going people um, yes. but as I said earlier CRS is trying to um, galvanize churches to be co-conspirators for queer liberation so what are some things that you would like to see churches do to advocate for queer and trans liberation I would love to see churches do more and what I mean by that is um, outside of pride month you know, uplifting queer and trans people, providing safe spaces, maybe um, groups or things of that nature, um, being proud to be accepting of every walk of life, right? Mm -hmm. um, and really fighting to dissect and what's the word I'm looking for? basically fighting to combat the ways in which so many of these conservative people take and and weaponize uh scriptures from the bible and being loud about how they're using it incorrectly and being loud about how um christianity or you know God or Jesus or, you know, whatever deity we're, we're referring to um, is supposed to be about love and how horrible it is to sit here and use it as a weapon to make people feel like subhuman. Um, I just don't see very many churches doing that. Um, I There needs to be people standing up against these people who are openly condemning um, gay people and trans people in the pulpit, like as the preacher, like there needs to, we can't be the only ones saying like, how are you preaching about love? And you're at the same time talking about how horrible we are as people. You will forgive a pedophile, but God forbid somebody be gay, right? You're probably the pedophile, but God forbid somebody be gay. You know what I mean? Like, I think there just needs to be a lot more vocalization happening um, mm -hmm. to where, again, gay and trans people don't have to feel like just because we, I, I, to be clear, I love being who I am. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't change me for anything, right? However, if it meant being able to just live a normal life and not be bothered. I might, but I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't live. I would, I would end up taking my own life. I'm just being honest. So for us people, we just can't help who we are to be like, well, damn, I guess I'm going to burn in hell. Like that's crazy, you know? And that's why so many of us like really remove ourselves from 
churches and from religion as a whole because it contradicts itself and it contradicts our lives and it tells us that our existence is basically a hindrance our existence our existence is an abomination our existence isn't okay and who wants to surround themselves with that you know um so i would love to see i think that you know having a billboard outside of your your church that says come as you are with a rainbow flag isn't enough that's i i think that that's you know it's a passive aggressive thing like it's saying hey we're going to accept you but we're going to do so quietly with our billboard and we're going to watch you all be you know condemned i don't see any churches that aren't already lgbtqia plus churches marching in the pride parades sponsoring the pride parades um making sure that you know trans day of remembrance is 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 celebrated you know i don't see that happening i just see the come as you are we welcome everyone on there you know with the little you know with the little letters and stuff that's all i see and i see a bunch of gay churches and 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 things of that nature but that's it so I would love to see, like, you cannot be an ally or an accomplice and not be actively all of the time an ally or accomplice. Allyship is a verb. It's a constant, you know, and that means year round. I don't get to take off my transness or my or my queerness. That's not something I can remove at the end of the day. So that means that every moment where there's an anti-trans le legislation or when transness are, you know, there's a basically a trans genocide happening, I'm fighting to just exist. Meanwhile, as it, people in the church who are not gay or trans, you get to just live your life. I mean, of, sure, of course you have your own things going on, right? Your own intersections, but then you, it's like hopscotch. You're like, okay, this time I'm going to jump in and oh, I'm going to roof myself is getting a little too hot. And oh, I'm going to jump in now. It's the, oh, we're visibility. Oh, mm -mm, too hot. Like it should be all the time. Just like I have to live it all the time. Hmm. Period. <laughs> Period. Um, okay. I, I was going to ask you if you felt as though the church that did it right, but you said, hell no. Nah. So all of us need to do more. Um, and I'll be challenging and agitating the definition of allyship as a constant verb. That's the first time I heard that. So I'm gonna take that from you. But of course, okay. you can for that. Um, but let's talk about this book. I actually have more than one book. So the, the, yeah, the I have, I'm actually uh, three books. Um, <laughs> um, but the book that you're talking about, it's a children's book. It's, excuse me, a children's book. Um, it's written for children um, and it's called Dads Give Birth To. And uh, it is a book about my family and it's told from the perspective of my oldest daughter, um, Azalea. And uh, it's written very simply. The goal of the book was not the storyline. Um, the goal of the book was a, an easy way to introduce uh, seahorse dads uh, to children, um, and more importantly, black seahorse dads. So it's, I think it's very uh, unique in the sense that not only it doesn't center me, I'm not the one telling the story, it centers my children, um, but it also talks about queer families in the sense and co parenting and uh mixed families so we have you know i was married to azalea's um poppy um and we divorced and then i was in a relationship with journey's dad and you know now we're all co-parenting um as a unit because we have to because they're sisters right um and so it shows you know two cisgender black queer men and a black transgender um, uh, man and two beautiful black young ladies. And you don't see that anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of like an introduction to, to that. And I'm very excited about the book because the illustrator is actually a black trans woman as well. And I introduced this book almost two years ago. 
And I definitely believe in divine intervention. I believe that everything happens for a reason. And my original author was was uh, non-binary. They were under the trans umbrella, but they were white. And for some reason, you know, they, we just didn't align. They, they said the book was too much of a project for them. And so I spent the better part of a year and a half just searching for the perfect uh, illustrator. And I believe I found her and I'm super excited. The goal is for it to come out in August um, of this year. I would have loved my birthday, but you know, life. Um, but the goal is for August. It's definitely going to be out in the last portion of the year, um, for sure. Um, and then I have an ebook that's actually coming out this month, um, and that is Transmasculine Fertility and Birth. And that book is um, for. It talks about one. It's it talks about both of my pregnancy stories. Um, it gives a lot of trans trans terminologies, and it also talks about um, testosterone and how testosterone affects the bodies and the myths that go along with it, and surgeries and how that affects pregnancy or being able to feed your baby. Feeding options for trans masculine people um, and resources, which there aren't very many, so that's going to be a short chapter. But anyway, <laughs> um, and allyship, how to be an ally for seahorse dads. Um, that's just an ebook. It's coming out, and then I have an autobiography. I don't know when that's coming out, but I'm working on it. I'm, I, I I'm not even midway through it. It's going to be long, but it's if you're not gonna if you don't want to read about trauma, this is not the book for you. It's full of. But if you're one of those people that love a good trauma, that's going to be uh, trauma. What do, what do I call it? Trauma porn. It's a, it's a lot of that, which is why it's taken me so long to to write it because whoo reliving opening wounds and things of that nature but i'm that's that's my baby uh it's gonna take a minute for that to come out though okay and all of these things we can find them on your website all of these things i want to i want to lie to you and say that i update my website regularly but the truth is that people don't care about websites anymore we just have them just to have them um the best way to find out about anything that I, I come out with is through social media, either Instagram or TikTok. They're both the same name, Caden X Official. I'm just putting it in the chat for accessibility. And that's on IG and TikTok. IG, IG and TikTok. And I, I update them both pretty much at the same time. Um, I'll, I'll tell you this, IG is more of where you'll get your education from. TikTok is where you're you're still going to get educated, but you're going to see a little bit of ratchet. I'm just being honest. It's a little, there's a lot of trolls on TikTok and I use the trolls as, as educational moments, but I have a very dry and dark sense of humor. And so that's what's over there. I leave that <laughs> over there on that side. Ain't nothing wrong with ratchet righteousness. Okay, right. we all... <laughs> work in front of the Lord one day. Um, I will say, please write the autobiography. I think if it wasn't for um, uh, the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou and like hearing about her story and like everything that um, she endured, but also like went through. And mm -hmm. although like I try not to call women strong, you know, or like resilient, uh -huh. but it is like a very brilliance to uh, folks that have endured a uh, certain levels of trauma that uh -huh. as a survivor of many things, it does give me hope that I too will just get And that's the it. hope. That's that's the whole reason I'm writing it. And I've already started writing it. So I and I'm trucking along. You know, I just make sure I give myself grace and moments to decompress and, and step mm -hmm. away from it. So that probably won't be out until next year ish sometime. But I will definitely announce all of that good stuff uh when it's when it's coming. Okay, those are all the questions that I have prepared for y'all and for you, Kaden. Um, I think we are at good five minute mark. Um, so if there are any final comments, questions, things, please stay up to date with CRS Chicago. We have an open mic at the end of the month, y'all, and Taylor's Tacos is catering. And I'm so excited uh, because they're Black and they're woman and they're queer owned in the South Side of Chicago. And we have two fabulous poets that are featuring um, and that's our final event uh, for the month. In addition, we'll be there at the Pride Parade 
um, with the Coalition of Welcoming Churches. So um, if you're available on the 25th, uh, please come out um, and then see you at the open mic on the 30th. But if this is the space, if anybody has any other questions or comments too. Hopefully y'all enjoyed it. All right, hopefully. I know I talk a lot. I <laughs> appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yes. It's Thank you. Thank you for giving of your time and sharing. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. I love smaller groups. I love that. Like, because <laughs> I don't feel so overwhelmed. Um, and, and I appreciate those of you that did get on camera because it made me not feel alone. Sometimes I went on Zoom. It's so like isolating to just be talking and it's just nothing. I need to see people like nodding and smiling. I, I think I'm kind of funny, you know, so I need to, I like to be able to see that. So I feel like, okay, I, my message is being received because, you know, I also have ADHD. So I know I can be like here and like over here and then come back over here. So I just want to make sure that I'm not losing anyone. So I really appreciate you all. No, so you're absolutely perfect. And Really, again, so, so grateful that you were available and everything was accessible and that we figured everything out. Yes. Um, and definitely want to be in conversation for one of these books come out and figure out how we can give them out to folks or purchase them or I can purchase Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's the that's the main goal, especially with the children's book. Uh, the representation is super, super important uh, for, I think, everyone in the community. Um, so, I, you know, I we can definitely... You know, just keep an eye out. I'll be I'll be annoying when it's time for it to come out, like annoying because I've been working on this forever. So <laughs> I'll be fine. I'm proud of you. Um, so that's it, y'all. I'm gonna give y'all the rest of your Thursday evening. Um, please, I think the message today should be have grace with yourself. Take a breath. Um, I'm glad that all of you guys are here. Um, and we are free until we all are free. So Ashe. Um, y'all drink your water. Be blessed. I'm going to end the Zoom now, y'all. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.